and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, we are honored to have on the Secretary of Education under the Trump administration, Betsy DeVos. She'll discuss with us the future of America's education system, including the evolution of school choice during COVID, the battle for and against critical race theory, and the ongoing changes to Title IX. But before we bring her on a little bit more about her, Betsy DeVos is a leader, an innovator, a disruptor, and a champion for freedom. She is the nation's leading advocate for education reform and freedom for students of all ages, having served as the 11th Secretary of Education. Her advocacy has led to the creation of new educational choices for K-12 students in more than 25 states and the District of Columbia and expanded post-high school education options for students and adult earners, learners alike. And finally, and most importantly, Secretary DeVos is married to entrepreneur, philanthropist, and community activist Dick DeVos. Together, they have four children and eight grandchildren. Secretary DeVos, it's a pleasure to have you on She Thinks today. Well, Beverly, it's great to be with you. Thank you. I first just want to start talking through your four years as the Secretary of Education. I know I wanted to get into what education has meant during COVID and also what it means of critical race theory that we're seeing and so many other topics. But just share with us a little bit what it was like to be the Secretary of Education overseeing the management and distribution of the federal budget for education initiatives. Well, Beverly, it was just a a huge honor to serve and to try to serve our nation's students and to focus on their needs and doing what is right for them uh, at every step of the way. That was the question that I asked myself daily and challenged my whole team with was to stay focused on doing the right thing for students. And, uh, and it was, it was just a huge, huge honor and opportunity. And uh, I, I'm committed to continuing to fight on their behalf. And something that you couldn't have expected when you entered that position of Secretary of Education is that we would have a global pandemic, something that none of us had ever seen in our lifetimes. And that has meant a huge disruption to the education system. When I think about what children have gone through during COVID-19, it is vast and we don't know how damaging it has been. I first just want to ask you, what do you make of how the education system has handled COVID? What has it meant for our children? Well, it it was, uh, of course, we didn't anticipate uh, a pandemic and we didn't anticipate what would unfold. What we do know is, uh, and we saw across the country, that uh, particularly the K-12 system uh, was very very unable and slow to pivot uh, to accommodate, to, you know, be nimble and create new opportunities to ensure kids could continue learning. Uh, learning was very unevenly applied or, or learning opportunities were very unevenly available. And uh, parents are even more keenly aware today than ever before of what their schools did or didn't do for their children and what they are or haven't been uh, ha- have or haven't been teaching and are and aren't teaching. And, and so this is, uh, I think, in a, uh, a strange way, been a huge opportunity for the future for kids. Yeah, you've said for a while that education must be reoriented around students and their families. Like you were saying, COVID provided this unique and unexpected opportunity for students to sit in in the classroom, even though that classroom was in their home in a virtual way. Do you find that you're hearing more that you have seen that parents are more concerned than ever before about what their children are being taught purely based on the fact that they actually had a chance to listen to what's being taught. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I think this whole last year's experience has only continued to point to a need for an education freedom agenda, really empowering families, empowering students to be able to uh, take the resources that are committed to them anyway and finding a place where they fit, where they are going to be challenged, where they are going to actually be able to continue to learn. And we saw all kinds of uh, creativity uh, in the last year around learning pods and different homeschool environments and all sorts of different new approaches to ensuring kids cont- could continue learning. But frankly, 
the, those that, the ones that were most able to take advantage of that are the families with resources. And it's the kids who didn't have those resources, whose families couldn't make those choices and decisions that have been hurt the most. And so it really does broadly point to the need to put all families in charge and give them the freedom with the resources to ensure their kids have the right education. And speaking of the children, for those who were not able to go back to school or only in the very end of the school year this year and they had to do virtual learning, how do you think children may be harmed or have been harmed by schools taking so long to reopen? Well, we know in many urban districts that failed to uh, offer learning in person at all over the last year and a half, uh, these kids are going to be woefully behind. I don't think we will know for many years the true impact uh, that this past year, year and a half has had on them. We know that uh, they are the most vulnerable. They're the ones who are most in need of the kinds of supports that they didn't get. We know that uh, mental health issues and suicide rates have skyrocketed. Um, we, we, you know, we know that harm has been done to the kids who can least uh, absorb the harming effects of having been out of school. And even shockingly, you do have still seemingly a push for schools to not fully be reopened in the fall, even when it comes to summer school. There aren't enough teachers in some school districts for children to make up the the lack of what they learn during the summer. Are you surprised that the unions, um, that some school teachers, not all, but some are still pushing, school board members are pushing for schools to not be fully reopened in the fall? Is that surprising to you? Well, it's, it's horrifying, and uh, I do put the blame squarely at the feet of union bosses, teachers union bosses, who have, have uh, taken this uh, tragic situation that our country has navigated through and used it to their advantage to demand things that have nothing to do with kids continuing to learn. And it's the kids who can least afford to be harmed who have been even more harmed as a result. And it is it, it, it is truly at their feet that we put this blame. Well, I do think COVID opened up the opportunity for parents to see what the curriculum included. One thing specifically that has been a hot topic has been critical race theory, which seems to have infiltrated schools. What do you make of critical race theory? Did you know or was it as prevalent during your time as Secretary of Education? Or has there been a huge push since the Biden administration took over to have this seep into our schools and into the curriculum like never seen before? Well, I think, frankly, this has been in the works for a very long time. Uh, I think the evidence of it just became uh, more, more widely known when parents were watching and seeing what actually was going on in their kids' classrooms. And um, if anybody wants to talk about uh, a system that is unfair racially, let's talk about the K-12 system that has insisted on continuing to be based on residentially based school assignments, which hurt poor and minority children, which force them to be in schools that are not working for them, and that continue to do a huge disservice to them and to everyone else. Uh, this is this is the true, uh, you know, this is the real problem. Uh, this is where, if you want to talk about systemic racism, we should be looking a system that protects itself, that uh, that fails to teach children for over a year, that has continued to make demands that are uh, totally unrelated to helping kids learn. And, uh, and one that keeps protecting the status quo and, uh, and really keeping, in many ways, kids imprisoned in a place that's absolutely harmful for them. And so what do you think this does tell us about our education organizations? You talk about, you just mentioned they're a front for the status quo. What do you mean by that? Are these political entities just uh, having a guise of an educational organization? Well, for, for there, there are so many different organizations that, are, um, that have offices and staffs and budgets in Washington that, frankly, are funded by taxpayer dollars that continue to protect the system that is. And uh, it, it has continued to fight against every opportunity for ha- families to have more freedom to make the choices that they need to make 
for their kid for their individual kids educations and uh, and and they you know it is a system that is protecting adults and adult interests it does not have anything to do with doing what's right for kids and uh, again i think this whole last year and a half has really laid bare this reality to parents that never considered that before as they have seen uh, you know parents who moved to a quote good district paid a higher home price in order to do it and then had schools and systems that were absolutely unresponsive to their children's needs. Again, all of this pointing back to the fact that a government, a solely government run monopolistic system that, uh, that, you know, uh, most people are not able to escape or choose differently from uh, has got to change. And we have got to empower families with the freedom to make these choices for their kids. And something that has been just astonishing to me and encouraging is to see the parents who speak up at these school board meetings, regardless of what type of pushback they get, that they're there to fight for their children, fight against critical race theory. And I think that there's some traction. Uh, even earlier this week on MSNBC, Imbran Kendi, who wrote the book How to Be Anti-Racist, said that he doesn't believe white people are inherently racist. And if schools taught that, I would speak out against that school. But the reality is that is what critical race theory teaches, teaches teaches that right. white people are inherently racist. Do you think that there has been enough pushback by parents where even the these activists who are pushing critical race theory realize they have to back off? Well, no, I don't think there's been enough pushback. I think I think we're just beginning to see the the you know the tip of the spear in terms of parents who are awakening to what has been going on in their kids' classrooms and uh, and I think uh, I think it's an opportune moment to build on to encourage that parents have uh, the control of their kids' education futures, be it with re the resources following them or, uh, you know, ensuring that the school boards that they elect are responsive to parents and not to the status quo to the system, which in all too many cases the school boards are. Well, before we continue the conversation, I'd like to take a moment to highlight IWF's Champion Women Profile Series, which focuses on women across the country and world that are accomplishing amazing things. The media too often ignores their stories, but we don't. We celebrate them and bring their stories directly to you. Our current profile is Kimberly Strassel, columnist and member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board. To check out her story, do go to IWF.org and see why she's this week's Champion Woman. Well, Secretary DeVos, before you go, I want to complete our conversation talking about something that was historic underneath your leadership at this, as Secretary of Education, and that is you oversaw a historic final rule under Title IX. Now, Title IX is the law that protects people from discrimination based on sex. What did you push forward? What did you achieve with this? Well, as a mom and a grandma, I knew we had to do better than the disastrous process that the Obama administration put in place. Uh, we needed to define sexual harassment as the sex-based discrimination that it is, and we did that. Uh, this rule made the rule historic in that it was the time that it had been done under Title IX. And, uh, you know, we needed to make sure that due process rights were upheld. Uh, we knew of hundreds of cases where uh, the, you know, the victim or the complainant had had to go through a whole process again because uh, the individual on the other side of the equation felt that their due process rights were not protected. And uh, hundreds of these cases have been overturned. Uh, the, the Obama Dear Colleague letter was a disaster for too many students. And so the process that we put in place is a very fair uh, framework that uh, that ensures that uh, that the complainant, the victim, has is in the driver's seat in terms of how that proceeds, and they have uh, they have every opportunity to say how they will continue to bring a complaint forward, file formal formal complaints or not, or just ask for accommodations, um, and and really extends a, a lot more protections to, uh, you know, those who've been uh, stalked or uh, online um, inappropriate behavior. And so we went way beyond um, what the Obama Dear Colleague letter did, which really in many cases uh, ended up victimizing victims. And such an important rule it is. And we are seeing that the Biden administration has expanded Title IX even further. 
they've made a move to include sexual orientation and gender identity as being part of the definition of what Title IX includes. In your opinion, what does this mean for women, especially in sports? Well, Title IX was created to give women an equal opportunity to compete in sports. I don't see how you can continue to say there would be a Title IX in existence when, on the other hand, you say that any individual who decides they are now female but biologically male can compete in sport. They're mutually exclusive. And so this is an issue that uh, I think we're just beginning to see the long-term implications of. And uh, my hope is uh, that people will wake up and realize that there will be no Title IX uh, if this, if this trend uh, continues. We definitely agree with you on that at IWF. My final question for you before we close is, what has life been like for you after you left office as Secretary of Education? Are you still working in the education sphere, or did you decide to take a little time off and spend time with your children and grandchildren? Well, I've had a little bit of time to have a little different pace, but um, and, and certainly to enjoy um, the time I can spend with my children and grandchildren. But my, uh, my work to advocate for kids and their opportunities for their education is going to continue. And uh, it is continuing in um, ways right now. You know, there's been 12, now nearly 13 states that have passed school choice programs, either new programs to their state or expanded on existing ones. And there are many, many more in the works. And so uh, working closely with uh, state legislators and governors to ensure that these opportunities expand is uh, is definitely a huge goal of mine to continue and to continue the advocacy at the federal level to support um, more opportunities for choices and uh, and, and families control of their kids education Uh, that that work is going to continue. Well, we so appreciate the work that you have done on behalf of children and families while you were in office and also the work that you've done still to this day. We so thank you for that and also for joining us on She Thinks. Secretary DeVos, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Beverly. It was great to talk with you. And thank you for joining us. Before you go, Independent Women's Forum does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. An investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. Please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting iwf.org backslash donate. That is iwf.org backslash donate. And last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. It does help. Also, we'd love it if you shared this episode and let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes. From all of us here at Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.